Good morning. Good morning. Those lights are pretty bright there. Uh, I'm glad to be here. My name is Adol Thalos, as you all have heard, and uh, uh, I do come from Egypt. That's where the name comes from. So uh, my parents immigrated to the U.S. when I was five years old, so I really don't speak English with much of an accent, so uh, that's, that's the reason for that. Uh, when, uh, when Ron told me that uh, I'd be preaching on Stewardship Sunday uh, for the first time here, I jumped for joy. Yoo-hoo! <laughs> All pastors love to preach on Stewardship Sunday, don't they? My, my favorite. And uh, since while we're at it, I might as well preach on... on um, on maturity, Christian maturity, and what that looks like in the life of the believer, uh, since uh, that's what I did my doctoral work. You know, two subjects that all Christians love, maturity and stewardship. Uh, Why not? So uh, that's what we're going to do here uh, this morning. So uh, I'd like to, uh, we're going to start here in uh, taking a look at 2 Corinthians, Uh, the the middle section of 2 Corinthians is all about Christian maturity and what that looks like within the church. And so we're going to be looking at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 15, uh, which follows after one of my favorite verses, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. But uh, let's, uh, if, uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to invite you to stand as, uh, as we read God's word here this morning. Paul writes to the Corinthians, We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this is not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. Accordingly, we urge Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. And in this matter I give my judgment, This benefits you, who a year ago started not only to do this work, but also to desire to do it. So now finish doing it as well, so that your readiness in desiring it may be matched by your completing it out of what you have. For if the readiness is there, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but that as a matter of fairness. Uh, Your abundance at the present time should supply their need, so that their abundance may supply your need, that there may be fairness. As it is written, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. Okay, please be seated. Please join me in a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, as we uh, spend time here this morning in your precious, precious word, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be working in our our midst as a community and in our individual hearts. Lord, we pray that uh, we might be encouraged, strengthened, changed, not the same people who came in, but more in the likeness of our Savior, our Lord Jesus. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, Again, as I said, this is is kind of a a tough topic uh, for pastors. Uh, It's a little easier for me as 
as a guest preacher and as a volunteer. Uh, when I've preached uh, on this subject in the past, it's always felt a bit self-serving. It's always felt, because, you know, some of your giving is uh, going to go in the pastor's pocket, if you will. Uh, but, uh, hey, I'm free to say whatever I want now, since uh, not one penny is going to be going to me. So, uh, but this is a tough topic, and I've had to live with it now here for a couple of weeks as I kind of prepared this sermon, and that's kind of what pastors do. We live with the message, and at least hopefully that's what pastors do. We live with the message, and uh, we do, uh, and that message really kind of sinks in after a while. And uh, as I've already told you, this uh, middle section of 2 Corinthians is all about this idea of Christian maturity, what it looks like, what it looks like in the life of a believer, what it looks like within the community. And uh, he focuses on a lot of pretty tough topics. Uh, and this section I want you to see is, is a bit different, because what uh, he's doing here is, is v allowing us to see generosity as something much more than we usually think of it. We, we usually think of it as some kind of a, of a charity, some kind of a deep, deep sacrifice of something that means so much to me and given to uh, somebody else uh, in need. And so it's, it's this idea of charity. It's a burden on me. And uh, Paul describes it very differently than that. Uh, so uh, in verse 6, he writes this, uh, complete among you this act of grace. See, what Paul is saying is that the grace that God has given to the Macedonian church, and he's going to hold up the Macedonian church as kind of his sermon. The life and what is going on among the church in Macedonia is going to be his sermon that he is preaching to the Corinthian church. Uh, so this grace that he's given to the Macedonian churches is the same grace that God desires for the Corinthians as well. Well, that sounds good. Who doesn't need more grace, right? We all need more grace. But what he's talking about here is generous attitude of our hearts is the very grace of God in the life of a believer. And as we grow in maturity as believers, we start to see this much more as we risk and go out in faith, in generosity, we see this much more. He said, grace here refers to God's undeserving gifts of kindness, which flow from his primary expression of grace, the Father's merciful reconciliation of sinners to himself in Jesus Christ. See, that's, that is essentially what we know of as grace. I don't know if... Uh, Y'all growing up, but uh, one of the ways I learned to define grace as a child was, uh, you know, the acronym G-R-A-C-E, God's Riches at Christ's Expense. Did you all uh, learn that as children? And uh, if not, I hope that's a, a good way for you to think about what God's grace is. It is the very riches of God at Christ's expense. Uh, Paul, uh, in the previous chapter here, to chapter 7, verse 10 in describing what, the, what grace looks like, what salvation looks like, he writes that they show the kind of godly sorrow that brings the repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. I think that's uh, kind of become a bit of a life verse for me because it really describes so much of what uh, God's grace looks like uh, for us as individuals. So God wants all of us to excel in the grace of generosity so that we might plant our roots deeply in God's reconciling work. You see, as generosity grows in our hearts and our community, we learn to deepen our faith and trust in the one who provides. And uh, Paul is talking about excelling in it. Now, uh, how do we excel in anything? I kind of gave you the answer there, right? <laughs> Practice. That's how we excel. That's how we excel in whatever kind of a job we might have, in sports, in art, wh whatever it is, it, we need to practice it and practice it regularly and uh, deliberately 
and harder sometimes, right? That's, that's kind of how we excel in anything. We practice the undeserved favor or the grace of God by stepping out and taking risks. Think about that for a second. It's kind of how you have to take that first step, the second step, the third step. You know, that's how we practice the grace of sharing our faith by being willing to invite a neighbor over for dinner that we know is not a believer, that does not attend church. We step out into uncomfortable situations for ourselves. We take risks. We go to places that uh, we've never been before. We speak to people that... uh, we've never spoken to before. And it's the same with generosity. Take a step. We risk. That's how we begin to excel in it, and we grow in it. Um, And now what uh, Paul's going to be doing is focusing on the Macedonian church. Now, I don't know uh, how much of you all have uh, ever studied the books to the Corinthians, But let's just say the Corinthians weren't the healthiest church. Let me just put it that way. They had uh, a lot of major issues. If you think you have issues in this church, read the letters to Corinth, and uh, you'll feel a whole lot better about uh, your own church. So uh, this is a church that was very troubled. They had a lot of uh, folks in there that were, as Paul is going to refer to them, as super apostles that were leading them down paths that were not good at all. And uh, they were creating all these divisions. It was a church in crisis. It was a bit of a mess. And uh, uh, I've kind of gotten to know a lot of churches that are in that kind of a setting, having done some transitional ministry for the last few years uh, in, in our denomination. There are, there are churches that are struggling, and so we, uh, my wife and I will uh, go there and kind of uh, help them through some real healthy church processes as they deal with some of their major issues that they are probably going to go through. And so uh, that's, that's been a challenge for us, but uh, God's grace has flown abundantly to us during those times, and so we're, we're very grateful to have uh, had that period, those years of, of doing that. So, the Macedonian church. Well, first, the first thing you should know about the Macedonian church is, as Paul describes them, they were extremely poor. And what is Paul doing here? He is actually inviting the Corinthian church to help with the poor church in Jerusalem. And the first thing he does is he gives an example of an extremely poor church. This is an extremely poor church, but it's a church that is overflowing with joy. Those aren't two things that we normally think go hand in hand in the Western church. That's not uh, necessarily on our radar. But it's funny, if you spend time with uh, missionaries, especially missionaries to very poor parts of the world, they will tell you that 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 is the most common thing they see, is that uh, these churches who are extremely poor will often exhibit the greatest amount of joy and gratitude in the littlest things, but most especially in God and being in the community of the church. Just amazing, amazing how God works in people's hearts that way. And so you have this church that is extreme poverty and overflowing joy, and what is happening? It's, well, as Paul describes, they welled up in a wealth of generosity. That's the literal Greek there, a wealth of of generosity. They were extremely poor on a worldly level, but they were very wealthy in their expression of generosity, as as Paul puts it. And only God's grace can do this. This is not common. It's not a worldly thing that uh, you're going to find very often in the world. But what you do find it is this is true among God's people. As God's Holy Spirit works in their midst, in powerful ways, we see this on display. They pleaded to be involved, as Paul writes in verse 4. They weren't uh, asked to be involved. They They were begging to be involved. They said, you know, I'm not sure exactly how they put it, but they begged. They pleaded to be involved with this. 
and they pleaded for the favor, as the ESV puts it, or the privilege, as the NIV translate it. But the Greek term is charis. It is this idea of grace once again. They pleaded for the grace to be involved in the giving to this poor church in Jerusalem. See, it is a grace to be involved. We grow in the grace of God when we are involved generously with others. It is God's grace and a great privilege to be involved with other brothers and sisters in Christ in God's great commission. I mean, I, I, I always wonder at that, but that is so true. Uh, as uh, Paul puts it here in verse 5, the most important thing for Paul is not that the Macedonians gave their money to others, but that they gave their lives first to God and then to God's appointed, anointed, called leader. And that, uh, as Paul is referring to himself and their ministry there in Jerusalem. See, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very Reformed, very Presbyterian. And uh, I'm very grateful for all the elders that you all have here. They are called, anointed, and appointed by the congregation, by you all. And uh, they are calling now upon you to join in this generosity, in this giving. And it is to join in the grace of it. Okay? This is not, uh, he's not, they're not asking for a burden adding a burden to you, but in some ways a relief of a burden, if you will. So, as for the riches in this present age, let me go to 1 Timothy here, okay? Uh, I think 1 Timothy is, uh, I mean, and I just want to make three quick points as Paul writes uh, to Timothy here in his first letter. He writes, as for the rich in this present age, and by the way, let me just pause right there. Who are the rich well, you know, we can think of some billionaires, and, uh, you know, there's Jeff Bezos, right? Is, is that who he's writing to? You know, I don't know what the exact statistic is nowadays, but it used to be said that even the, the poor in America are, would be considered in the one percentile throughout world history, if not throughout the world today. We are a very rich society. So I think probably when he says the rich in this present age, he's probably referring to me. I don't know about you, but he's definitely talking to me. Okay? Charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. I think that's an amazing verse. I want to just make three quick points from this passage. True life is never found in possessions, objects, and money, but in relationships, especially with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I think that's very basic biblical doctrine. Real life, which is truly rich, is rich toward God and not things. Okay. Let me make a third point real quick. And uh, I'm going to make it through an illustration. I want you to imagine, this is, uh, this is now the Civil War era, okay? I want you, I want you to imagine that you're a northerner but uh, you've been living in the South during much of the Civil War. Now, you have just received insider information that uh, the North is going to win the war. Okay? It's uh, getting near the end of the war. You know for a certainty that uh, the North is going to win. Well, what are you going to do? If you're shrewd, you're going to take most of your Confederate money and trade it in immediately for U.S. money, keeping just enough for your short-term needs. Okay? 
That illustration, I think, kind of gives us a good idea of what Paul is saying to Timothy. Because you and I have the ultimate insider information. There is going to be an event that overturns this world, and every money in this world is going to be absolutely worthless. And it's the return of Jesus Christ. And if it doesn't happen in our lifetime, it kind of happens to all of us when we die. Everything that we have is uh, going to be absolutely worthless on that day. And so the question for us is, uh, have we exchanged, if you will, our Confederate money for U.S. currency? Have we exchanged our earthly money for worldly treasures where we are to store our treasures and that's in heaven. So that's, uh, I think that's the third point that Paul is making here to Timothy. Now let's, uh, let's go back to uh, the letter to the Corinthians. Let, let me talk about the Corinthian church for a minute. They, uh, they had been in rebellion for a while and uh, now things are beginning to turn around. And uh, what Paul is calling them is from this rebellious stage now, you have the opportunity to give themselves to God. This is what happens when the grace of God uh, takes root in a church. And that's what's going on here in Corinth. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 8, verses 8 through 10. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. And in this matter I give my judgment. This benefits you who a year ago started not only to do this work, but also the desire to do it. See, before, a year before this, they had started to raise the funds to give to the Jerusalem church. And in their rebellion they had stopped. And now Paul is basically calling them to finish the job. Finish the work you had started. The Macedonian example creates this kind of a positive test to stimulate greater Christian maturity in them. The greatest way to honor our Lord is not because we must, but to do what is required out of love and joy, having willingly given ourselves to Jesus. And then uh, Jesus here is our ultimate example, isn't he? Who who was rich, who who dwelled in heaven and gave up all of what he had to live in a humble existence and to die on a cross for us that we might be saved. And that is the greatest example for us. The grace of generosity is the willingness to give up our rights for the sake of meeting the needs of other believers. There's no requirement to give beyond one's means. Paul makes that quite clear. And so for each of us, That means we need to take time with our Lord, asking Him where we need to, how we can excel in this gift, this grace of generosity. And then actions without the right attitude is not ultimately what God desires. God desires a genuine heart attitude that is filled with the grace of generosity because of the generosity that Christ has shown to us. Participating in generous, joyous giving was a means to become more like Jesus. And also it was a way to unify the church, you see, because I then see myself as a part of the work that God is doing through his grace in other churches and uh, other parts of the world throughout, through our missionary giving, that we can be a part of that, a part of what God is doing in building his kingdom in so many parts of the world. If we've truly given our lives over to God, then all the resources that we have at hand belong ultimately to him. And that's what it means to be stewards of what God's resources that he has placed in our control. Generosity ultimately comes from a response to the grace of Jesus as we're empowered by the Holy Spirit. Let me me close here this morning by telling you of a certain lady that uh, I think... uh, after learning about her, uh, I, will, I will never forget because she taught me so much about what generosity looks like. Her name is Edie Ogan. That's uh, the uh, older lady there that's uh, in the middle of the picture. She uh, died at the age of 88 in 2019. She and uh, her husband uh, 
had one natural child, but then they adopted 11 more and raised two others as well that uh, wasn't an official adoption. And uh, they also happened to have 77 foster kids that had gone through their house at uh, one time or another. Now, that's not the most amazing thing. She also supported uh, 40 missionaries at one point, and uh, especially through uh, her prayers and letters. And uh, she was uh, quite amazing, but that's, that, that's not really the most amazing part. Sorry, is what she had written, uh, and uh, she says uh, this, I'll never forget Easter 1946. I was 14, my little sister O.C. 12, and my older sister Darlene 16. We lived at home with our mother, and the four of us knew what it was like to do without many things. My dad had died five years before, leaving my mom with seven school kids to raise and no money. By 1946, my older sister was married and my brothers had left home. A month before Easter, the pastor of our church announced that a special Easter offering would be taken to help a poor family. He asked everyone to save and to give sacrificially. When we got home, we talked about what we could do. We decided to buy 50 pounds of potatoes and live on them for a month. This would allow us to save $20 of our grocery money for the offering. Then we thought that if we kept our electric lights turned out as much as possible and didn't listen to the radio, we'd save money on that month's electric bill. Darlene got as many house and yard cleaning jobs as possible, and both of us babysat for everyone we could. For 15 cents, we could buy enough cotton loop to make three pot holders to sell for a dollar. We made $20 on pot holders. That month was one of the best of our lives. Every day we counted the money to see how much we had saved. At night we'd sit in the dark and talk about how the poor family was going to enjoy having the money the church would give them. We had about 80 people on our church, so we figured that whatever amount of money we had to give, the offering would surely be 20 times that much. After all, every Sunday the pastor had reminded everyone to save for the sacrificial offering. The day before Easter, O.C. and I walked to the grocery store and got the manager to give us three crisp $20 bills and one $10 bill for all of our change. We ran all the way home to show Mom and Darlene. We had never had so much money before. That night, we were so excited we could hardly sleep. We didn't care that we wouldn't have new clothes for Easter. We had $70 for the sacrificial offering. We could hardly wait to get to church. On Sunday morning, rain was pouring. We didn't own an umbrella, and the church was over a mile from our home, but it didn't seem to matter how wet we got. Darlene had cardboard in her shoes to fill the holes. The cardboard came apart, and her feet got wet. But we sat in church proudly, despite how we looked. I heard some teenagers talking about the Smith girls having on their old dresses. I looked at them in their new clothes, and I felt so rich. When the sacrificial offering was taken, we were sitting on the second row from the front. Mom put in the $10 bill, and each of us girls put in a 20 As we walked home after church, we sang all the way. At lunch, Mom had a surprise for us. She had bought a dozen eggs. We had boiled Easter eggs with our, friend, with our fried potatoes. Late that afternoon, the minister drove up in his car. Mom went to the door, talked with him for a moment, and then came back with an envelope in her hand. We asked what it was, but she didn't say a word. She opened the envelope and out fell a bunch of money. There were three crisp $20 bills, one $10 bill, and 17 $1 bills. Mom put the money back in the envelope. We didn't talk, but instead just sat and stared at the floor. We'd gone from feeling like millionaires to feeling like poor white trash. We kids had such a happy life that we felt sorry for anyone who didn't have our mom and dad for parents and a house full of brothers and sisters and other kids visiting constantly. We thought it was fun to share silverware and see whether we got the fork or the spoon that night. We had two knives, which we passed around to whoever needed them. I knew we didn't have a lot of things but that other people had, but I'd never thought we were poor. That Easter day, I found out we were poor. The minister had brought us the money for the poor family, so we must be poor. I didn't like being poor. I looked at my dress and worn-out shoes and felt so ashamed that I didn't want to go back to church. Everyone there probably already knew we were poor. I thought about school. I was in the ninth grade and at the top of my class of over 100 students. I wondered if the kids at school knew we were poor. I decided I could quit school since I had finished the eighth grade. That was all the law required at the time. 
We sat in silence for a long time. Then it got dark and we went to bed. All that work week, we girls went to school and came home and no one talked much. Finally, on Saturday, Mom asked us what we wanted to do with the money. What did poor people do with money? We didn't know. We'd never known we were poor. We didn't want to go to church on Sunday, but Mom said we had to. Although it was a sunny day, we didn't talk on the way. Mom started to sing, but no one joined in, and she only sang one verse. At church, we had a missionary speak. He talked about how churches in Africa made buildings out of sun-dried bricks, but they needed money to buy roofs. He said $100 would put a roof on the church. The minister said, can't we all sacrifice to help these poor people? We looked at each other and smiled for the first time in a week. Mom reached into her purse and pulled out the envelope. She passed it to Darlene. Darlene gave it to me, and I handed it to Osi. Osi put it in the offering plate. When the offering was counted, the minister announced that it was a little over $100. The missionary was excited. He hadn't expected such a large offering from a small church. He said, you must have some rich people in the church. Suddenly it struck us. We had given $87 of that little over 100 We were the rich family in the church. Hadn't the missionary said so? Deep down, I knew that we were actually the rich family. Amen.